Welcome, welcome to the Swindon Festival of Literature, or rather the virtual online Swindon Festival of Literature. Thanks everyone for joining us, and we do hope that things are well where you are. Now we are both pleased and grateful that human ingenuity, cutting edge science, and digital technology make it possible for this show to go on, or at least to go on online. Today's guest, who is passionate about working with authors and their books, for example, she writes, I believe books can change lives. And she also says, you need courage to publish and you certainly need courage to write. She tells a fascinating story. In her book, A Bite of the Apple, A Life with Books, Writers and Virago. And here it is, um, a beautiful green cover and a terrific book, um, which is part memoir and part history. She tells the story of a great publishing adventure from the inside. Please join me in giving a Swindon Festival of Literature online welcome to Chair Virago Press and author of A Bite of the Apple, Lenny Goodings. Lenny, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. I really admire your enterprise and the long time that you've kept this going. Good for you, really good for you. That's a very nice of you to say that, uh, Lenny, but you know about keeping things going as well. I do. Um, <laughs> We'd have loved to have had you live in Swindon. Um, we, we love having authors to Swindon. Um, and Swindon is very lovely in the spring. Um, have you ever been to Swindon, by the way? I think I have been to Swindon in the spring, in fact, because I remember, I remember Seas of Daffodils. Yes, I've come to the WH Smith headquarters to sell our books. And I remember it must have been sunny because I remember it had these kind of very modern automatic windows so as soon as the cloud disappeared the windows would open and as soon as the cloud um, came back uh, the sun came back the, the uh, windows opened again it was very uh, futuristic and uh, kind of exciting and a nice good, a great place to sell our books to yeah no that's the uh, wh smith hq in swindon um which is a nice building um thanks for that uh, lenny we better get to the topic in hand um your book um in fact your newly published book a Bite of the Apple, which tells the pioneering story of the emergence of a great publishing house and asks key questions, some of which we'll discuss after you've told us a little bit about the book. But I'd just like to warm you up by reading something you've written in the preface of this book. And you say, Virago lives within the tension between idealism and pragmatism, between sisterhood and celebrity, between art and commerce, between independence and being owned, between having in behaving independently, but for over 25 years being part of a conglomerate, between watching feminism wax and wane and then become popular again, while at the same time knowing so many of the battles are still to be won, between being modest and yet aware of one's power, between trying to do good in the world and sometimes failing tension does seem to be an integral part of change. Uh, tell us more, Lenny. Thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me, as I say. It's really a great pleasure to be here. Um, this is a book about books. It's Bite of the Apple, A Life with Books, Authors and Virago. And I was really conscious that I've lived through a really fascinating time for women and been part of one of the most significant British publishers. So I wanted to write a book that's part memoir part women's history and part publishing history. So I've written this short talk for you. Words, writers and books have been part of my life forever, but it wasn't until I worked in a bookshop on the west coast of Canada in Victoria that I learned that there was a creative arts industry, particularly publishing. And I remember working in the bookshop and thinking, I wonder who decides what gets published. So when I got to London, I decided to look for a job in publishing and I eventually landed at the feminist press Virago in 1979 and I've been there ever since, amazingly, as publicist, editor, publisher and now part-time as chair. Virago, literature, feminism, women in business, women writers, politics are my daily bread. I left Canada alone to try my hand in Britain and through a sort of blind instinctual feeling that it was right to pursue a job that felt like it might make a difference, had found just that. I was not long out of university with a head full of literature, had bought a round trip air ticket and told my family, 
I would stay for one year, try anything, everything, head home probably to Toronto to get a proper job. Over four decades later, still in London, married, now with two grown children, and I'm chair of Virago, the feminist press. Over these years, probably close to 100 women have worked at Virago. We've published nigh on 4,000 titles and just over 1,000 authors. In Virago's first month, a reporter asked if Virago would find enough books to publish next year, as if. My first encounter with Virago was at lunchtime in Soho, 5 Wardour Street. I'd been in London for about a year and a half and was working at a publicity company. I was learning about feminism, living in a collective house. Politics were gripping. So I wrote to Virago and was invited to come and see them. Up five flights of stairs, past a pinball arcade, a gentleman's club. At the top, gasping for breath, I walked through a tiny passage, whirring with a photocopier, and I found three people in a small room beneath th three small windows. Carmen Khalil, Harriet Spicer, and Ursula Owen. It was 1978. This extraordinary enterprise had been founded just five years before, had, already, had published its first books only three years before, <clears throat> and was already making waves. Carmen Khalil founded Virago in 1973. She chose the name Virago, which means heroic, warlike woman, because it was provocative, outrageous, and fun too. We did everything ourselves, we typed, we packed the books, we licked the stamps, dragged bags down the stairs full of review copies, and we also took turns cleaning the office. And one Friday night, I was late, still working, and it was Carmen's turn. While she was cleaning a telephone, I said, why did you start Virago? The answer came in a beat. To change the world, darling, that's why. I knew I was in the right place. Out on the streets were feminist politics. The personal was political. But in those days, publishing boardrooms were mainly Oxbridge men. Lots of women, as now, but not with power. The world of independent publishing began to change with the rise of the presses, Sheba, only women, the women's press, among others. The mainstream houses also became part of the revolution. Penguin, particularly. Granada published Germaine Greer's The Female Eunuch. I feel very strongly that feminism benefits all genders, and that Virago was reaching out to all readers. We've always had the firm view that we are not niche publishers, we are there for everyone. But our mainstream stance of bringing voices from the margin to the mainstream was not appreciated by all. Radical feminists accused us of being the acceptable face of feminism. And I can tell you, celebrity feminism is not a compliment. Whereas the mainstream, on the other hand, in the press, alternatively championed or belittled us, calling us paper tigresses, or when we had disagreements among us, cat fights. Then, like now, the feminist stereotype existed, but it was too late for these naysayers. We had enthusiastic supporters, men as well as women, and it meant we could blast through the gatekeepers. In publishing, editors are the first gatekeepers. If a manuscript or story or an experience speaks to them, they believe it will have a market and they bring the book to acquisitions where the next gatekeepers, finance, sales, marketing, publicity, and CEOs sit and judge. The salespeople will be anticipating the bookshop gatekeepers. The publicity will anticipate the press. It's easy, therefore, to be conservative, to go with what's already working, already selling. The hardest thing an editor is up against is when they know and therefore say at these meetings, there's almost nothing on the bookshelves like this. This is utterly original, or this is a new voice we've not yet heard enough of. That leaves the gatekeepers without any reference points. And so, though they may still say, let's publish, they will be cautious, unambitious. And until we have a wide variety of people in these positions of high and low power, we won't see a proper change in publishing. But what is exciting to watch now is that change is being forced upon established practices from the outside, like movement, by movements like Black Lives Matter. It was the same when Virago and feminism forced the other publishers to learn. We had our ear to the ground. We knew what was missing, women's stories and experiences. We were part of the feminist movement that made the mainstream publishing houses change. To begin with, Virago looked back. Sheila Rowbottom's influential book, Hidden from History, showed the way. 
It told women their history had been forgotten or never even written. One of our early books was Vera Britton's deeply moving Testament of Youth, so important, a woman's account of the First World War, never out of print since, one of our bestsellers and filmed twice. Virago published stories not heard before or, lie, or about lives not deemed worthy of print. In 1978, Carmen began the Virago Modern Classics. This reprint of 19th and 20th century novels by women has become our enduring flagship. People, women mainly, went into the shops and looked for the green spines and thrilled to the discovery of great writing by women. The classics reached out into the parts of the UK and Britain and in return, we received hundreds of letters saying, you've changed my life. The Virago Modern Classics is a series that challenged what is great. At the time, basically only four or five women were deemed good enough to enter the canon of English literature. Jane Austen, George Eliot, the Brontes, Virginia Woolf. Very few other women were studied. The Virago Modern Classics challenged that. What is great literature? And more importantly, who decides what is great literature? These were questions that some of, some of the ones that underpin the Virago Modern Classics series of forgotten women writers, from Elizabeth Taylor to Zora Neale Hurston, from Rebecca West to Bessie Head. This series set out to demonstrate a formerly largely invisible female literary tradition and has been acclaimed for profoundly changing English reading habits. The writers included our Rosamond Lehman, Rebecca West, Sylvia Townsend Warner, Mary Webb, Antonia White, Barbara Pym, and from America, Edith Wharton, Willa Cather, Anne Petrie, Gail Jones, among so many others. Individually, they're not political novels, and some of them are middlebrow even, but together they make a political statement. Literature by women, worth studying, worth reading. On the front list of Virago, we continue to explore history, health, working class voices, we published Pat Barker's first novel, Union Street, Kate Millett's Sexual Politics, and great contemporary writers. There's three in particular I want to mention, Angela Carter, Mar Maya Angelou, and Margaret Atwood. Margaret Atwood has been with us since 1979. We are her UK paperback publishers, and can you possibly imagine what it was like for me, a young Canadian who had studied at her at university in my Can Lit course, to be publicizing her novels, The Edible Woman, and surfacing. It was daunting, it was thrilling. Looking back, I can see, partly, that I can credit Margaret Atwood for alerting me to the idea of Canadian publishing. When I found a copy of her poems in our school library, I was thrilled to discover she was Canadian. Of course, we were mainly studying British and American writers, and mainly men. Margaret Atwood, went on to write prescient books, The Handmaid's Tale, obviously, but she was always ahead of her time. The Edible Woman is about a young woman who reluctantly agrees to get married and suddenly finds she can't eat. Her Mad Adam trilogy is about global warming and her wonderful historical novel, Alias Grace, shows what happens to women when they are cast into predetermined no roles as victim, seducer, hysteric, or villain. She's utterly brilliant funny, wise, and a great Virago supporter, my heroine. Angela Carter was another great supporter, wicked, passionate, original. We published her novels, The Magic Toy Shop, The Outrageous Passion of New Eve, and her nonfiction, highly controversial, The Saudian Woman. She completed an, an edited collection of the Virago book of fairy tales for us as she was dying. Just doing this for the girls, she said. Maya Angelou came into our lives in 1984. It was a profound meeting for me. I took her around Britain and watched as her readers loved and admired her. Her astonishing memoir, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, was first published in America in 1969. And she told us it was sent to publishers in Britain, all of whom turned it down, saying, nobody's gonna be interested in the life of a young black girl growing up in the Southern states of America until Virago found it. 15 years later. Readers loved her for her belief in speaking the truth about racism, about being raped, about politics, but also her belief in the power of poetry, in the belief that we are all more alike than unalike, and because she had style and grace and the most enormous, wonderful laugh. My job is to commission and edit authors to help them realize their vision on the page and I'm really lucky to work with the likes of Sarah Waters, Sarah Dunant, Sandy Toxvig, 
Linda Grant, Natasha Walter. And I thought that I walked alongside my authors, held their hands, took the flack and praise alongside them. And though that is not untrue, ultimately there is just one name on the book. The rest of the author's team is behind them, but the author is out front, alone. And that has been really salutary, publishing this book. And even though I've edited hundreds of books and worked with authors, sometimes line by line, I don't think I had appreciated the sheer stamina it takes to think, to write, to rewrite, to edit, to dig deep, to complete a book. Wow. Changing the world with books is not simple. At Virago, we, are, we were trying to inspire, to entertain, to publish quality books and make a profit in order to survive. It put a lot of pressure on us all in the early days. We sometimes fought, we cried in the loo, we wrote angry memos, didn't speak to each other. Margaret Atwood, familiar with small publishing houses in Canada in the 1960s, dryly observed in the BBC4 documentary about Virago's history. In my experience, the smaller the cheese, the fiercer the mice. However, ask any passionate self-starting ideological group about rows and difference of opinions and operating on a shoestring, and I suspect you'll find the same story. Over the years, we've taken many tough decisions. And finally, in 1995, five years after I became publisher, we decided to sell ourselves to a larger company. We sold to Little Brown. Since 1995, over 25 years now, Virago has been an imprint in a large publishing group. It was a good move for us. We're still here, the only feminist press from the early days left, and we're still going strong. With the sale, we got what we needed, capital, might in the market, money to properly reward authors and to pay staff properly, and an international reach. But crucially, we maintained the integrity of our list. We continued our original vision, a very broad view of what a Virago title is like. We've kept the range from polemic to literary. Over the last few years, among many other writers, we have published the extraordinary Sarah Waters, one of the greatest storytellers. Her novels, Tipping the Velvet, Fingersmith, The Night Watch, The Little Strangers, The Paying Guest, have all been huge successes for us and all filmed too. The American writer, much loved by Obama and recently chosen by Oprah for her book club, Marilyn Robinson, who wrote the beautiful prize-winning Gilead Quartet is one of our strongest titles. The feminist comic, Deborah Francis White, has brought us The Guilty Feminist. We've gone on to publishing new Virago modern classics, all of Du Maurier, all of a lot of Patricia Highsmith. And we continue to bring women's stories mainstream through memoirs. Most recently, for example, The Last Girl by Nadia Murad, a young Yazidi woman who was captured by ISIS and survived being a sex slave and went on to win the Nobel Prize for peace. We continue our tradition of literary nonfiction, biogs and essays. Just this month, we published The Light of Days, the untold story of Jewish women who fought in the resistance by Judy Battalion. And what of straightforward feminist books, polemic? In the late 90s and early 2000s, feminist thought and protest seemed to go underground. What's your problem? Women have jobs, don't they? We had a female prime minister. Where is your sense of humor? Living Dolls, The Return of Sexism by Natasha Walter wrote out in 2010 on the new wave of feminism we're now on and was received with great relief and open arms. Today, against the backdrop of things like hashtag me too, feminism has a real and powerful voice. People are listening and I'm glad, but I still have a bugbear about books, novels written about by women, sorry, novels written by women. You never hear the term male novelist. He's a writer, genderless, neutral, universal. And anyone who is not a white male writer gets an adjective, woman writer, gay writer, trans writer, black writer, etc. That shows just how they are not universal, how their lens is particular, even limited. There is still a perception that most novels by women are for women. Women will read novels by both women and men, and on the whole, men do not return the favor. Many have pointed out to the disparity on the critics' pages, reviews of books by men far outweigh those by women. Women dominate the fiction market. We buy more, sell more, write more, read more. 
And all the studies show that when men do read literary fiction, they mainly read fiction by men. I'm not talking here about gendered writing. I'm talking about gendered reading. On the whole, in the 20th century, women have not struggled more than men to get published. And after the 19th century, after George Eliot and the Brontes, women have been able to publish under their own names. My question, my bugbear is, how is women's writing regarded? Is there assumption, this is what I call gendered reading, that a novel by a woman will be about home and domesticity and love and therefore read only by women? Kate Moss, the co-founder of the UK Women's Prize for Fiction says, literature with a capital L is still not seen as a neutral literary voice if it is for a woman writing from their own point of view. But it's not just that a woman's view is limited, it's also, therefore, that it's not important. Why don't men read fiction by women? There's lots of theories. Sometimes I think it's about a perception of the subject, the domestic novel hovering over most women's novels. But if you are a man and you write about the intimate, about love, about feelings, does that term still apply? When its writers are Ian McEwan, Jonathan Franzen, Julian Barnes, Colm Torbin, Michael Andache, does it mean instead of the domestic novel, they're writing about important things? Maybe it's because publishers are sometimes as bad as toy manufacturers, pink for girls and blue for boys. There are some books that I, as a self-respecting woman reader, wouldn't want to be seen with. No wonder men are put off. Often when you point out to men who read fiction, they probably only read men, they're really surprised to discover that fact themselves. They probably have read, they may not have read, Margaret Atwood or Sarah Waters, though they probably have read Hilary Mantel. She won the man Booker, as you know, but she also has a male protagonist. Being seen as not as important or universal as men's writing means a disproportion in review space, literary prizes on school and university curriculums. We cannot stop highlighting these problems and asking these questions. Respect, being taken seriously, taking the credit, being vigilant matters hugely. And you see what happens to women who do put their heads above the parapet, who are outspoken, visible and strategic. Though things are changing even as we watch. So to finish in the same way that Matt began, Virago lives within the tension between idealism and pragmatism, between sisterhood and celebrity, between art and commerce, between behaving independently, but for only 25 years part of a conglomerate, between watching feminism wax and wane and become popular again at the same time, knowing many of the battles are still to be won. At Virago, we've always treaded a line. We're not a lobbying group or a charity. We are a business. We have to make a profit. We have to get our hands dirty. We have to compromise. But I love that aspect of Virago. It's challenging and it's real. Changing the world with books. That's been my job. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, if we were in the theatre now, you'd get a round of applause, um, but you could get one from me. And thank, thank you, you very much, Lenny. You throw up so many questions and um, what your talk has just shown, that this book is much more than just a kind of inside story of a publishing house, as if that would be a simple story anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it's, and, and, and we, we can't address everything, but I want to address one or two things. And one of the things I'd love to address, and you've, you've touched on it, is this question. This is a literature festival after all, so I want to focus on that a little bit. Um, what is this thing called literature? And uh, uh, how, you're now an editor as well. Um, how do we make decisions about writing, whoever it's by, whoever it's by, whether they have an adjective in front of them or not? And um, you say some very interesting things about that in here. And you also made one or two generalizations as you have to. For example, men don't we read women. I, let me just- I can, I can feel you bridling even as I <laughs> said that. <laughs> if, I, if I tell you that I prefer G. Eliot uh, to T.S. Eliot, if I tell you that Antonia White is up there in Virago classics on my shelves like, like no other, if I tell you that Jeanette Winterson sits alongside, then you'll know um, that there are men. There are men who I just like good writers. I agree with you, but if I tell you you're the first man to interview me and all my, my books were reviewed by women, my book mm. was reviewed by women in all the papers. I just thought as I was coming on, I thought, how oh, interesting, yeah. you're the first man to, sorry, yeah. the second, only the second. Mm -hmm. 
No, and that's interesting too, Lenny, because we think of different interviewers for different authors. And I quite often think it's good to have both genders represented, mm, whether it's too. a panel or whether it's two people. It's just some sort of balance there. Um, and we're all on a all spectrum. Genders. Did you agree? I do, actually. But I mean, back to your question about who, you know, about literature. The, yeah. This is why, I mean, I've been really, really struck by how publishing changes watching the Black Lives Matter. And I, I really now firmly believe that institutions like publishing, but also other kinds of institutions don't change internally. They, ch they may want to, but they don't have the, the sort of the really pressing need to do so until social movements change things. So feminism changed all sorts of institutions, didn't it? It changed teaching, it changed libraries, it changed uh, businesses, of course. Um, and then the uh, LGBTQ plus movement also has made huge changes. And now I'm watching, as I say, with Black Lives Matter. And the thing is, you have to get the people who are part of this movement. I, always, I slightly think the movements are, are, you know, I slightly fanciful think of them as readers' revolutions in some ways, because one of the things that the, the people in the movements are saying is, I am not in the books. I am not on the television. I am not in the theaters. You know, I want to be there. And the way to get me there is either, either people who are not them um, reach out and understand or, or try to understand, or you put those people in power. And uh, that's how you make change. And that's how you get to conversations about what is literature, you know, what in, in the book, as you, you will remember, I have this very, I talk about this really interesting panel once that Angela Carter and Grace Paley and Susan Sontag were part of. And there was a, it was really Susan Sontag, who I admire hugely, but you know, she had a very high, um, slightly old fashioned idea, I think, of what is literature. And she, she sort of rather disparagingly called things um, testaments of experience. That was her way of handling you know, a sort of less, uh, less polished, I suppose, something like that, but, you know, m a more authentic voice. And you could see Grace Paley and Angela Carter didn't feel comfortable with that at all, actually. But that, those are the kinds of sort of gauntlets to get thrown down, don't they, in terms of who, not so much who decides, though there is also that, but who decides what is literature? Who decides what should go into a book? Who decides a life that is worthy of being in print? Who decides what subjects are worthy of being in print? And you know, it's. I don't think I have a. I mean, I'm de definitely against the canon because I think the canon was very excluding. Um, and there, and you know, I'm hardly alone now. There's a whole decolonizing, isn't there, of, of literature courses and things like that too. So, but you know, the one thing. Sorry, I know you want to ask me another question, but this is obviously means a lot to me. The one thing I would say, because people then get incredibly worked up, saying, oh, God, everything's so woke and everything's so politically correct and things like that. And one thing I would just say, I haven't been on this planet for as long as I have and also involved with these kinds of things, is, you know what? Change is really awkward. And sometimes bad things happen. Sometimes mistakes are made. Sometimes, you know, it's like a fire burning through and sometimes it burns up the wrong people and run the wrong thing. Sometimes the babies get thrown out with the bathwater. But it corrects itself, you know, and I, I just feel like I feel tolerant of the um, some of the pain that you get through change because it, it dismantles certain things. It dismantles sometimes, as I say, very awkwardly. But I, I do think that is how you get change. And it, it does it, it does correct itself again. And one of those awkwardnesses is and Susan Sontag was a photographer as well as a writer. And she cared, they cared very much about a notion of correctness. And you, you called it a bit old fashioned. You know, she, she cared about whether a colon was used or a semicolon, that they should be used correctly. In other words, she had a notion of writing as art that was somehow detached from propaganda and life, and that it needed to elevate itself to some level where it was an art form. And I think that is a, a dilemma that many editors. Uh, many publishers, uh, many writers face of caring passionately about something, feeling propagandistic about it, yet perhaps not realizing that there is a difference between speaking passionately about something and mm -hmm. writing well about it. Do you come up against that? Yeah, well, I do. I definitely, I mean, I'm not even, I don't even mind the phrase testament of experience, so long as it's not 
um, a disparaging description. Um, I mean, I do treasure writing. I do, I feel, you know, my favorite writers would be people like Grace Bailey, in fact, Shirley Hazard, Marilyn Robinson, Sarah Waters, Margaret Atwood, you know, who are great writers, because I think I find, I find thoughts, deep thoughts, pleasurable stories, really nourishing. You know, I feel like, like eating books is, is, would be something how I would describe how I feel about books. So I think, I think the quality of writing is really, really important. I'm not saying it isn't, but I don't think is no, it's not a binary thing. You know, there are of there are there can be books that aren't as well written, but they bring a, a story to the to the table that no one else has heard. I mean, we published a book by Waris Deary, a Somalian nomad, um, who became a model face for Revlon and all. And she suddenly revealed in a magazine that she had experienced what she called feet, what was then called female circumcision, which is now FGM. And she was virtually illiterate, but she told her story to someone else who then, and we published that book, it's called Desert Flower, which is what Waris Deary means, Desert Flower. And, you know, it, I wouldn't say, it's not a great work of literature, of course it's not, but it's an important work of literature. And I feel you can, there's, there's lots of important works that aren't necessarily brilliantly written. And I, I don't, I, as I say, I don't think it's a binary game in publishing. There's plenty of space for both. But, but I think you're touching on something there that is a kind of sincerity and authenticity that a childlike, uneducated voice has, which is as good as art. It has a purity to it and, and an authenticity. And so I understand that. And so th those two are good writers. But, but nevertheless, you say it's not binary, and I agree with you. Uh, you're having to make judgments all the time. I'd just like to quote what you say on, on literary fiction before we move on. Um, I want to look at literary fiction, you say, because even though it might attract fewer readers than, say, crime or romantic mm. fiction or beach novels, what it does command what it does is command headlines, prizes, reviews, features, authors' appearances at festivals. In other words, high visibility and respect. A headline in the Observer to mark the Booker Prize at 50 says uh, says it all. Flawed, but still the best way to judge writing. And I think literature is still a good way to judge our society as well, you say. Um, these are the books that, good literature, are the books that become set texts and are translated into other languages and are incorporated into the canon. These are the books that society, or rather those who have platforms to make such judgments, deem great. The Virago modern classics began in 78 with the idea of blasting this canon wide open to challenge the narrow notion of great and also to challenge the idea of who gets to decide what is great. And I want to say congratulations on the Virago classics because they are great, they're magic, they're wonderful. Who made those judgments? Um, Carmen Khalil was the first because she founded the, the, uh, the series, so she was the first one. And then it passed other um, editors. Today it's Donna Coonan who's our editorial director, but um, it, it's, it has been, well, it's been a combination of um, led by one view, but very open to other other people. So when we, when Carmen first started, for example, people like Antonia White was still alive. So she suggested all sorts of people, Rosamond Lehman, you know, so a lot of writers suggested, then booksellers would write and then author, um, readers would write and suggest. And that's still the same. So Donna Coonan, who does, runs today, the editorial classic, she definitely, she takes a lot of soundings from people. And because you can't be an expert in every area by any means. So you do turn to the experts and ask them who's been neglected, who, who, should, um, who should we read again? And then we use, actually ask those kind of experts to write um, introductions. And so that helps, you know, bring it to a new, to a new form. Um, yeah, I think it's it's a it's it's a bit democratic in the sense that lots of people suggest, but you know, one person has to take responsibility. Yeah, yeah. And the great thing is, it's lasted. The Virago classics go on. Um, I'd like to move on to something else that um, festival followers often ask authors questions about, and that is money and creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
the judgments that are made at your level about books that come to you via agents or otherwise, um, the judgments you make uh, in relation to how much money can we make out of this and how good is this writing? What's the balance? Yeah, it's a, I mean, you know, ultimately it's a, it's a marketplace, isn't it? You know, we, that's why I like to make that point that we are not a lobbying group. I mean, though we do lobby, <laughs> we're not a charity, we're not a library. You know, the way we protect ourselves, the way we protected ourselves when we were independent was to make a profit because then, because we could then stay alive. And the way we protect our sort of the integrity of our list now that we're part of a larger organization is to make a profit. Because if you make a profit, then, you know, the powers that be stay away from you because they think you're doing the right thing and they don't bother getting involved. So these, you know, making a profit is very important. Having said that, in most, in all across most publishing, um, about 80% of things that people publish don't make money or just break even, you know, it's a, in, in all art forms, it's more like 80, 20 film theater. They're all, it's all the same thing. Music probably too. Um, but to how much to pay an author depends. Yeah. I'm afraid it is very market live, um, d driven because it's you, you sit and you imagine how many copies you will sell. And that is how you make your mind up of how the advance, how big the advance should be. And the and the don't forget an advance is an advance. It's not a fee. It's not the final. Um, it's not a final salary, as it were. Do you know what I mean? So say say you paid somebody five thousand pounds, and then the book really took off. They get a, they get royalty. So they're part of the. You know, I mean, someone like J.K. Rowling got a couple thousand, I think, for her first book. But obviously, royalties have been fine for her. Um, you know, so it's not the end of the story. It does say that it the publisher is taking a risk. And I know it looks like the publishers don't take enough risk, but the publisher is taking a risk. It says, okay, I think we will put you, you know, the, that we'll make money out of this book or we'll break even. And therefore we will advance you this much money. We will take the risk. We will pay the printers, the typesetters, the editing and things like that. And if it takes off, you make more money as do we. I mean, the advances are pretty small. Having said all that, I mean, I do, I do think you can, it's very few people who can, live full time on of our on my list i would say people you know like obviously margaret atwood sarah waters uh linda grant sarah dunant but most of my authors have other jobs you know they um marilyn robbins is obviously not but most have other jobs they teach or they do journalism you know it's very difficult to make a lot of money out of books um does that answer your question it's a sort no, of no, it's, no, it, it, it answers it perfectly and in fact i just want to tell listeners and viewers that there's quite a section on on that and uh, Lenny writes at some length so people who are more interested in that there's lots about that there's lots also about all sorts of authors so so there's lots of that and there's also about the well infighting is the kind of cliche for it but actually the discussions that people who are doing some pioneering project and working together especially when they're part of a smaller organization rather than a larger one um, the arguments they have, and I don't like it being called infighting. I like to think of it as intelligent people who are keen on their product, who all have a different ideas of how to do it well, trying to work out how to do it well, and almost loving their product so much at the expense of their friendships. I don't know what it was like in Virago. Can you shed a little more light? I mean, I know there's stuff in here in the book. You sound like you speak from experience. <laughs> that's kind of why i said ask any self-starting passionate organization of course you're gonna i mean people come to it because they feel strongly about the subject don't they um and also in in you know in what you're doing and what i've done too actually is i i have been thinking about a lot you know is this a job or is this a vocation and you know to be honest i feel i feel my i have had a vocation um so but a lot of people who come to Virago feel they have it, you know, they come as out of passion, and it's difficult to balance that with the even I would say, but for myself, it's difficult to balance the fact with the fact that it is also a job, you know, and you've got to it's got all the constrictions and constraints that a job has, you know, um, who's in power, who takes the decision, and how do you make money, you know, how do you keep going and. It, it feels to me that everything's fine until you hit a, a wall, you know, until like, I mean, when we we had our sort of 
arguments was because it was the uh, there were certain times in publishing we made some mistakes definitely and i talk about that in the book but also it was the net book agreement feminism was following falling slightly into the, the sort of doldrums as i said in, in my talk and we hit we hit some problems and so when you hit problems it's how you solve those problems and that's when those things really come out isn't it you know and they, and it's not so long as everything's working, even tensions can be handled. But as soon as things start cracking, the, those tensions you know, really bust out because everyone then has to find a way forward. And it's difficult in a business because a business is about taking compromises and making money. And those, you know, who decides what the compromises are is really where the, where the tension lies, I think. And those compromises also apply quite clearly, you say so in your book to the criticism and arguments you might have with other people outside the organization, in other words, people who are more extreme than you in some views or others, uh, and you can't please all the people all of the time. And once you're doing this, you also speak about courage, the courage that writers need and the courage that publishers need. And, and I think you're so right, uh, Lenny, your head's above the parapet, you're doing something. And there are other people who are sitting in pubs and not doing something, but complaining about what you're doing. And it's very hard. It's very hard. And uh, I don't know what li life has taught you, but to, it's taught me that in order to be radical, I need to be moderate. Mm. I mean, it's strange that I mm. need to modify my ideals um, in order to achieve something. Um, I think what you need to do is understand. Under done that? Yeah. Well, I think what you need to do is understand who you're talking to, you know, who and what language to use. I mean, personally, there's lots of ways of changing people, aren't there, or changing ideas. Personally, I think subversion is a great way forward, <laughs> you know, not to, not to be, um, you know, I, I feel change for me is change is not hitting something over the head. So it changes actually, you know, showing somebody. I know, I, you know, people were scared of women, aren't they? Scared of powerful women, showing that you can be a powerful woman who brings them along, for example. I think those are, for me, that's the way change can, can take place. But, you know, like you, I'm in a place that's got to go on, you know, so it's easy. I mean, I told you in, in the book, I have this very funny, I'm at a, um, a conference in Bradford and um, one, the, the, another woman on the platform, Mona Etalawi. So when they ask her, somebody asks her a question and she says, fuck the patriarchy. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, yeah, right. But I've got to run an office. You know? so I can't fuck the patriarchy. Just not quite as obviously as that anyway. So I, I think it's, you know, that's what I was saying earlier about change. I think change comes on many fronts, actually. And, you know, you, you work out your road, it seems to me. Yeah. Um, thanks very much. We, we're almost coming to the end. Um, my last question to you is going to be, why is your book published by OUP, not by Vivarago? But before you oh. answer that, before you answer that, um, I'd like to, I've mentioned, uh, I should be promoting your book, but I'm promoting your company. Um, I mentioned a couple of the books that are on my bookshelves, Antonia White, Virago Classic, but this is my all-time favourite. Oh, yes. The writing of Anna Wickham. She is oh. my all-time favourite poet, and I don't really generally do favourites. And I, I, I want to read a poem of hers, um, while you think of your answer to why your book is published by OUP instead of Arago, I'm sure there's a good reason. Um, this, is, this poem is The Affinity. Um, <clears throat> I have to thank God that I'm a woman, for in these ordered days a woman only is free to be very hungry and very lonely. It's sad for feminism, but still clear that man more often than woman is pioneer. If I would confide in you thought, first to a man must it be brought. Now for our sins, it is my bitter fate that such a man will soon to be my mate. And so a friendship is quick end. When I have gained a love, I lose a friend. It is well within the order of things that man should listen when his mate sings, but the true male never yet walked who, who liked to listen when his mate talked. I would be married to a full man as would all women since the world began. But from a wealth of living, I have proved I must be silent if I would be loved. And now of my silence, I have much wealth. I have to do my thinking all by stealth. My thought may never see the day. My mind is like a catacomb where early Christians pray. 
but of my silence I have much pain, and of these pangs I have great gain, for I must take to drugs or drink, or I must write the things I think. If my sex would let me speak, I would be very lazy and most weak. I should speak only, and then the things I spoke would fill the air a while, and then clear like smoke. But the things I think now, I write down, and someday I will show them to the town. When I am sad, I make thought clear, and then I can reread it all again next year. So I have to thank God that I'm a woman, for in these order days, a woman only is free to be very hungry and very lonely. Um, and I love that poem, and it's strange for a man to be reading it, because it says something about the human condition. I love Anna Wickham. She says things about me. She says things about being human and how tricky it is, how tricky it is to be understood and to be loved and all the things we think are the rightful things. And, um, and it's so brilliant. And she was ignored. And I wrote about her and she was still ignored. And then you published her and it's just brilliant. And I know many people who have discovered great things through Virago. So um, that's my rather passionate way of saying thanks, Virago. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Why, why is A Bite of the Apple not published by Virago? Well, the very simple answer is OUP asked me to do it. And I was so I was commissioned. I, I was there the very, very great luck. I didn't have to sort of tout around a manuscript. Somebody asked me to write, and that was amazing. But I wouldn't publish the Virago. That would be too close. <laughs> I don't yeah. want to, you know. It's yeah. uh, it's better to have an outside view. It is, and uh, and this tells the story really well. And I I hope nobody is cross with you because quite often authors say I can't yet write because the people I want to write about aren't dead yet. Um, but you've written about living people. For the most part and has it been okay yep yep i showed everybody the book before i published it yeah yeah um well thank you very much lenny um thank you coming, thank you for having me no for coming to the swindon festival of literature um this is the book uh, a bite of the apple um lenny the swindon festival of literature says thank you very much thank you <laughs>